Thank you both. Uh, certainly no problem. I would like to thank both uh, Mr. Ibeo and Mr. Blust. Both your speeches generated uh, questions and remarks in our chat. And uh, our first question is for Pedro. Uh, what is the cost comparison between repurposing existing infrastructure versus totally new? Because I think you could persuade people to repurpose more if it was uh, cheaper as well. Yeah. Well, this is a this is a, a classic question, and it's a, one that the easiest way to understand how complicated it is to answer it is costs for whom. Uh, if it's individual costs on the short term, it's almost always new built cheaper, and this is totally attached to the fact that uh, legislation is very uh, strict, and it's good so because it gives us more safety and health but at the same time gives us less flexibility to, to, to be adaptable. Let's take, for example, the staircases in almost any building in Old Town Paris, they would have to be demolished if they go into renovation because uh, it's too, the angles of the inner corner are too uh, small. You would have to make an all new staircase. So the, the legislation has to be more flexible to allow cheaper renovation. But of course, if you see it on the side of, of the environment, the costs, um, way better, like there's, it's less costly for the environment if you renovate, absolutely. And I can give you a very short example. This is, I think, important. Um, when you're building, for example, take a shopping mall uh, that's now built everywhere in Poland also quite a few. Um, it's uh, the waste is not even on the packaging or the energy. The biggest waste is not that. The biggest waste is, for example, you order thousand new windows for the facade and they should arrive on day 20 for exam, example but uh, as usual in construction history there are delays so the the windows arrive on the day 20 and the, those walls are not ready and it's too if the timeline is too long it will be more expensive in taxes and warehouse and in transportation for those windows to be stored and then put in, in, the, in the place, then to actually just throw them away immediately, new package, throw them away in the garbage and order exact the same after some days. So this happens all the time. The biggest waste is actually new stuff that's ordered and it doesn't fit timing. Just for and, and I bet that doesn't even factor the environmental impact of making the glass in the first place. Exactly. Does it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's a very illustrative uh, uh, example, uh, Pedro. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question for uh, Sepp de Blust because uh, you mentioned some of these repurposing of spaces. And if work always expands to fill the space allotted to it, what if we allot more private public spaces to people for kissing first girlfriends, for example? I mean, you know, places without a specific purpose that are open to interpretation by people in the moment. Oh, absolutely. That was going to be my last, last slide, <laughs> actually. So I was going to end my presentation with um, indeed the idea that these kind of safe grounds for learning could also be urban projects. And I think it should be become more and more an agenda of urban projects of, of also physically creating um, places that allows you to, to calm down, to slow down. Um, and of course, that's not a... Um, it's not an easy thing to realize because it's it's um, yeah as, as I said it's a bit disruptive it's a bit uh, counterintuitive um, from a kind of a, let's say a capitalistic perspective to create these kind of places it's 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 not on their agenda so it's an alternative agenda um, but I believe that there is a lot of possibility in the alliance with for instance sustainable development goals and with uh, for instance um, the acknowledgement that we have to create place for water in our city or the acknowledgement that we have to create place for eco ecology in our city I think that is more and more also on the European agenda so I can imagine actually that these kind of investments um, could also be used 
to create enough kind of free space, space to calm down uh, for ourselves. Um, and, and maybe there um, is this uh, the possibility to kind of combine these agendas and to be creatively about it and use this kind of sustainable um, investments as a window of opportunity in a way to also include um, this more um, kind of yeah, free zones. I think that that could be a, a, an interesting approach. Uh, Pedro, how would you respond to that? No, oh, that's fantastic. Seppe, we should talk more because, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, we've been doing a lot of those stuff here in Helsinki. Uh, there, for example, there's a development here called uh, Suvi Lahti, which is an old industrial area, like uh, Victorian architecture um, and super amazing open spaces. And it's been abandoned and it's been the cultural place of Helsinki like the, the best one, the, the biggest festivals. And it's, most of the year is just empty, but then there's in the summer, it's full of activity. And of course now comes the, the new sky, the first skyscrapers of Finland come there. Uh, and, uh, and this, all this under the lead of a left-wing um, uh, city hall. Uh, and it's in Imaki, which is the new deputy mayor, uh, uh, approaching all of this in, in a very lenient way in our view uh, uh, we are not so happy about it, but places for um, uh, to have to do nothing, or places of, of where there is actually no plan whatsoever. Like plan, or Richard Senate we'll, we'll talked a lot about this, uh, like uh, uh, seat planning. We used to call like uh, don't don't plan everything. Just leave just leave the the seat there. Just do do some platform where people start to interact with it. It's fundamental. And if the city doesn't allocate uh, enough of these pockets where exploration is allowed, uh, uh, creativity is dying out. There is no adaptability. There is no resilience to, to changes like happen now with Corona. And, and people are just bored as hell. I mean, how, you go to the same, it, there's, what else is there to do? Like restaurants, bars, and it's all the same. It's all the same. There's. Yeah. Uh, I think what is bizarre no, what is bizarre there is that I think as designers we are perfectly crafted to really support this agenda to yeah. create these kind of places but also as, as Pedro just uh, presented to not build we're perfectly crafted to not build I think we're as architects um, quite key also in the process of not building eh? and of adapting and of yeah, changing etc so and that's that's in that sense bizarre that that in, in one way or another also if you look at education i think in educational practice it seems that the whole profession or at least 90 percent of the profession is kind of co-opted by another agenda which is maybe not ours and i think that's that's for me the the, the biggest thing of how to develop strategies that, that we can diversify our agendas a bit more and, and, and also start to play a role in this kind of alternative approaches, which I think are more and more key for sustainable development. Yeah, well, if I may just give a short comment, I think the pressure is tough because if you work in an office, uh, you are paid by the amount of square meters almost that you plan. If, if you say your client, well, I didn't plan that, just 10%, I think is the best, you get paid less. Uh, it's a very yeah, tough problem. So it's, it's, but it's about changing the, the way you structure your office. For instance, with Endeavor, Absolutely. we said we're a cooperative. We don't count hours. We never do that exactly. uh, in order to have enough time to invest in proactive uh, research, etc. So, But it's indeed, you cannot just change one thing. And I think that the, the scheme of Pedro showed that beautifully, how all these kind of elements are connected. So it's not about changing one little thing because then another will just take it over. But it's kind of slowly, slowly changing the whole uh, uh, mechanics. Agree. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Seppe, one of your slides mentioned that when you're challenging modes of power and control, you need to fold greater uncertainty and amateurism and slowness. And I really liked what you said that when you move fast, when you think fast, you quickly move into existing modes of thought, existing thinking. Uh, the two of you working together, how could you encourage greater embracing of uncertainty and amateurism and slowness in these multifunctional, multi-purpose spaces where people from designers all the way out to the ordinary user are comfortable relinquishing control and deterministic uh, urban design? 
Yeah, that's a big question, of course. But Pedro, if you want to first uh, react. Uh, no, I was just uh, uh, picking up the, what was talked before in the, in the beginning of, of this uh, conference about giving uh, voice to the people. Uh, and then, then it was uh, talked that give, give more voice to, to the creatives. And, and I would say give less power to, the, to, to, for example, deputy mayors. I mean, I don't have anything against those people in particular, but there is a massive um, concentration of power and people making those decisions. They are elected by the people, they go to the city. Most of them, I would say 99% of them, at least the ones I know, none of them are even an architectural or, or engineering degree. And they are deciding all of the buildings that are going to be built in the city. Uh, and it's in, in a daily basis, in a volume unheard of. And this accumulation of power should not happen. I think we should tackle not only Give more voice to people, but give less power to them. So yeah, and I, what I try to present in my presentation is that it's indeed a structural issue, but I think a structural issue we place a role in every single moment of life, and and as such, you also as a designer have a possibility to change these little moments of encounter. For instance, um, we did an experiment a, a couple of months ago. We built a a big um, kind of a, a, a sandbox, a desert in the middle of our studio. And we invited the head architect of Brussels to start commenting on the projects of our stu students. Normally he will just start to comment and really play his role and be in power. But now we asked him to step into the sandbox to leave his, his shoes <laughs> be exactly. barefooted and started yeah. to play around. And I think just by these little things, you can already challenge power as well. And of course, it's not enough. Um, it's, and it's a bit soft, but I, I do believe that also this kind of little soft moments are an important element in the whole chain of structural change. Totally agree with Seppe. I mean, uh, this is fundamental also to understand. And your graphic showed really cool. I like that one with the two arrows, which is like this incremental, this also the patience which is needed. I mean, and it's frustrating for everyone, not, not just, I mean, we are now talking, but a lot of people are listening and of course they have an opinion and they want also to share. And I was in that position many years or many times, I still am. And, and it takes a lot of patience to, 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 to have some improvement, but that's, and yeah, if it would be too easy, it would be boring, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we have to be patient about this. Uh, yeah, and we've been doing similar stuff. We're creating now a decision machine where people interact with certain, uh, it's going to be in the Venice Biennale next year, not, wasn't this year uh, because of Corona. And uh, also with some uh, urban urban planning for kids in Qatar and also with the MIT. So we've, we've been trying out this and I, I must say with kids uh, um, is, is really fundamental, I think. It's really- Can you really tell us a little more about can you tell us a little more about uh, teaching urban planning to kids, Pedro? Yeah, well, it was two programs now that one was in Qatar in this WISE Summit, which was a, a conference for education was last year. And I brought their uh, architecture by kids, which was basically reimagining the city of Doha, dividing it in eight pieces and with uh, blocks of wood. And they would just try to reimagine how they uh, remember without phones, of course. And then of course, they just build, built a new city. Like what, and what things do you need? And then we would discuss. And this was just half an hour, eight schools and, and very young to, to teenagers and everything just worked really well. People, the awareness of what's needed in a city goes really, really fast. If you have a little bit of guidance to, hey, hold on, but where, and it's not too big. Oh yeah, it's too big. And of course, the other one is, has been Urban Dots, which is, uh, a game that we developed uh, with the MIT City Science Lab in Alto. Uh, and so what I did there was just to create a, two boards with Legos, people putting Legos and remaking a place of the city and those Legos would be scanned automatically into a 3D. And then they will, they, there would be the, the, the currency are the dots of the Lego. So the, if you put housing, four dots of housing will need one dot of commercial one dot of that and then it would be and the, the numbers would come up and then it would be to negotiate how can you create a sustainable blue uh, part of the city and the kids played for three hours there uh, so uh, without breaks that was really um, I think the, the, the main asset 
I said there is, is not only um, how to start designing with kids, but how, how to use the imagination of kids to also start to trigger another way of thinking for adults. So it's, I think it's about this uh, combination of both worlds. And I think their children really have a big power to, to kind of uh, bring up again, a new approaches in a very kind of vulnerable, open uh, way. Um, yeah, which I can can imagine really could help certain processes to to create a bit of an openness to step out to um, reimagine things. And and the design thinking is is important one mm -hmm. uh, because most I think in school we are taught a lot uh, yes or no answer like uh, two plus two four and the rest is wrong. But design design thinking is mostly like there is no right or wrong. There is the best possible approach that you came out with that certain amount of time, uh, and that was the best you could do. And I think that's not so explained in 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 schools. It should it should be more adult. Well, I think it's great that you got children to enjoy thinking like urban planners for three hours and without uh, their phones. That's uh, quite impressive, Pedro. Yeah, I get a medal. <laughs> we have a question for uh, Sepe. If, uh, let's see. Uh, the question is, if design is defined as fitness for a particular purpose, how can we encourage more design in cities without a uh, tautological purpose behind it? So more open concept spaces where people can impress their own vision onto the space. How can we encourage more design like that? Well, it's a um, good answer that question in two ways. I think in, in one way you could really, um, uh, again, give the example that springs the dry dogs, the street space, etc. But another way to approach it is a way to see the city as a constantly changing thing. Um, and I think that's, that's the case, if you look at reality, it's it's a constant set of interventions, both in the past and in the future. So I think it's also about how we perceive the city. Um, and, I, uh, and indeed, often the city is perceived as kind of a dominated function, which is planned there. And But I think it's maybe to learn to see that this domination is not that absolute, that there are even in a very dominant, even if you go to a shopping mall, you can still start to maybe in extreme examples, start to spray graffiti. <laughs> or, in the, or in another way, you can still start to kiss your first girlfriend and we just take over a shopping mall and use it as our free space at a given moment in time. And it can be a collective decision of a, a group of youngsters in a certain city to claim a place. And I think that's, that's for me also, that's, that's, I think the more important answer to this question is um, really use your own agency or the agency you have as a collective to just not accept um, that a certain place is interpreted only from a certain perspective. Because in a way, the city is it's, it's just um, a big white or filled canvas where you can add things to it. You can change it. You can use it in a different way. And of course, sometimes conflict will be part of that, but that's unavoidable. Well, uh, that's quite well put, Seppe, because there was a general comment in the chat along those lines, and I'd like to ask uh, both of you. Uh, it seems, especially when we look at uh, Pedro's provocative uh, slide with the very limited amount of direct uh, decision-making that the democratic process has in how urban planning uh, you know, plays out in the real world with so many other unelected agencies that have more impact, but ultimately, if developers are overpowering the space and focusing only on profits and not the comfort of inhabitants, um, how can we balance the pressure of developers and their balance sheet with the needs of inhabitants whose economic productivity and benefits often occur outside any one balance sheet? Pedro, would you like to start? Yeah, I mean, this is... Uh... It's, it's, a, it's a loophole. It's very tough to say we have to tackle there or there. But uh, one thing I think is in common, everyone actually if in a sane society, uh, uh, in, in an open society, for example, in, in Finland or Helsinki, everyone actually wants a, a good city, open spaces. Everyone actually wants to, 
temporary experimental everyone is for it even even the mayor Jan and Annie, uh, the deputy mayor everyone wants that but then comes the pressure of the the money of the of the contracts of we have to pay the bills you know where does the money come from if we don't do this so it almost it's almost like uh, and i have several cases of these people that work even part-time in the city of helsinki as in the architectural department and they are activists during the morning and working for the city during the afternoon uh, and i said can you live with both by like criticizing what you do in the afternoon it's literally so uh, I, I think we we have to keep on like Seppi was saying we have to keep on uh, trying and trying for example there's a lot of stuff squatting has been such an such an amazing um, process I mean I'm not a big fan of it but I think it is a really con uh, great movement of contesting the uh, empty spaces uh, uh, also the temporary structures I mean uh, there is a and in, in Germany have a lot, and here in Helsinki you have the Alas Sea Pool, which is a temporary swimming pool that now everyone loves it. I'm, I'm sure it's not going to go anywhere. And uh, you 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 experiment more, you are able to do more, and you excite people, and then they they start to see it's possible. They start to see there's also business around that, and so on. I, so it's it's being patient. Would you like to say? Would you like to say something about that, uh, Sepe? Yeah, just quickly. I think what Pedro said was crucial that you can play in multiple roles. Um, so it's not there's not one direction. It's about playing on different levels. And, and until now, I think um, we both played a bit this kind of a more disruptive role of including and introducing new ideas in order to disrupt the system. But the nice thing is that we have another thing in common. I just Googled Pedro and he yeah, ran for uh, elections. Um, so going to, uh, or whatever, uh, going for kind of a more this um, democrat democracy of negotiation, let's say, of agreement, of consensus building. And I was a former um, um, politician here in Antwerp for six years in the city council. So it's, it's really playing on these different approaches at the same time. And I think that's the only way to slowly, slowly, um, yeah tackle this kind of power issues. It looks for the other people who are listening that we have way too much free time. <laughs> I'd like to see more free time, but I'd like to see it spent on activities that are outside of material financial concerns. Uh, how can we encourage more experimentation in our cities? And then we have time for one uh, important question for both of you. How, how, how to foment more experimental stuff? Uh, I, I, I think, uh, for example, there's one one measure that they are trying out here in Helsinki, which is uh, the 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 public the participatory budgeting, and they said uh, regions, not just the city, but regions of the city, will decide will, will propose uh, uh, stuff. And the ones who get more vote, they get the budget. It doesn't really work fantastically, but it's a good step forward because, of course, the one who wins is the one who knows more people, right? At the end, it won like a, a new football field because all the kids knew everyone. But at the same time, it involved the kids in knowing that they could experiment, that they could do it. So that's a good change. Well said. Seppe? So I'll quickly uh, show my window i think it's a, it's also about design it's about this <laughs> creating these bizarre conditions of a roof a train a park behind it and really allowing this conflict to happen and i think this is we all have to adapt with this bizarre space and we do that and it triggers creativity so i think this is also for me an important aspect to as a designer not go into kind of a softness a synthesis mode but more this composition of elements I think they can play a crucial role. I think that's a beautiful view. And for people's mental health, I think we need to consider <laughs> such things. We only have time for one more important question, and it's to both of you. What is your best piece of advice for sustainable city design? If you could tell us one thing. Acknowledging, I'm going to be again critical. Uh, acknowledging that guys like me with two master degrees in specialization in urban planning and all this career in building, we still don't know shit. And, 
people need to intervene. People need to be aware that experts are really just humans with a bit more understanding of some parts of it. They should be listened, but they don't know everything. Yeah, explode the cult of expertise. Well said. Seppe. Yeah, I think I would just support that. And um, so it's, I think it's going towards the senior improvisers and look for the senior improvising yourself, but also start to invite others, which are actually very good in improvisation. And I think that's actually something we all have in common. And there is an expertise as human uh, humans we all have, and, and that could really help to trigger that a bit, being senior improvisers. Uh, Pedro, Sepe, gentlemen, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful chat. I wish we could continue, but uh, my thanks once again to both of you.